a successful Best Driver's Car Week. Cheers. So there were tons of comments, tons of views, lots of questions, and today we have the chance to address some of those comments and clear up some of the confusion surrounding this event. So among the questions we get most often is, why not this car, why not that car? So let's start there. So we want 10 of the newest, most fun to drive cars out there. Yeah, not, oh, we would have loved to We want to everything. Have, if I we could have a M5. fleet of 25, we that'd be great. <laughs> I wanted the M5. <laughs> but logistics at the end of the day ultimately limit what we can do. They were going to give us an M5. BMW said you could have an M5, and then about two weeks before the uh, competition, they said, you know what, our US spec M5 isn't ready yet. No M5. So that's why there's no M5. As for M3, um, it's not new. For, for best driver's car every year, we try and get either something that's new on the market or something that's been significantly updated. You know, Ferrari was a case in point. Uh, they didn't want to uh, send a 458. There wasn't one available. These things don't grow on trees, surprisingly enough, even for Ferrari. And, and they felt like the FF and the California weren't really driver's cars. And then, you know, there's also people say, like, why no Viper? You know, we put it on the cover of our magazine. How come we don't have the Viper? Well, no one's driven the Viper yet. We still haven't driven it yet. This is two months after we shot Best Driver's Car, and nobody from any publication or anyone outside of Dodge has driven the Viper yet. Another thing people want to know is how could the top three contenders be cars that have automatic transmissions? Right. Well, you know, only one of them actually had a, a real automatic. Even that didn't, didn't have a torque converter, it was a wet clutch. But the other two uh, were, were double clutches. A good transmission gives you control of your gears. And the best dual clutches, and I'm telling you, the Porsche PDK is the best on the market, and the Nissan is number two or number three, give you instant, easy control of your gears. And that's what you want when you're driving fast. Well, they're not, they're not automatic transmissions. They're automated manual transmissions. The only thing that's missing is the clutch pedal. Right. I don't see that a car or a technology, a technology that, that enables you to drive a car faster, how that can be a bad thing. I mean, manuals are in decline. Uh, if you look at best driver's car for the past four or five years, we're seeing less and less of them. Those three cars wouldn't be better with manual transmissions. Right. And not only that, I mean, you know, people say, like, oh, you know, well, what do you do with your left foot? You know, well, stick it on the brake pedal. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, get some left foot braking going. You can really do that in these cars. You can be on the brake even as you're coming off the gas pedal and then back on the gas as you're coming off the brake. It's fractions of a second every time, but you can be so much faster and smoother when you left foot brake. And then when you've actually got precision controls of exactly what ratio you want to be in, when you want to be in it, I mean, it's the best of all worlds. And, and again, I'm just going to say this for the hundredth time, but the PDK in the new 911 is the best transmission on earth. I mean, it is, I've never had a transmission, like the harder you brake, the faster and the more it downshifts. You know, it, it's intuitive, it's, it's just incredible. Yeah, it's, just, it's just an incredible feat of engineering. All right, another thing they wanted to know was why did we keep calling the Mustang and the Camaro rental cars? Because, uh, you know, and again, my point in saying that, I was the one who said that yeah, 100 he's times. Harsh. He's a harsh man. I'm a harsh man. <laughs> but my point is that it's a quick way to say that these cars start out life when they're being designed uh, as something that you can go down to Hertz and rent for the weekend for $9.99 a day. The 911 starts out life as a 911. It's never anything else. The GTR starts out as a GTR. Now, the C63 actually starts out as a you know Portuguese taxi cab, but they did an incredible job on that. Yeah, I mean, we will just forgive Mercedes. Absolutely, I'm still blown away with that car. Me too. So, but that's why I say that they start out life as twenty thousand dollar rental cars. Let's talk about our favorite moments of BDC. Mine was going around the track with you in the Lamborghini with no brakes. That was, uh, I have two favorite moments. That was because I don't think we've, you've ever driven in a car with me before. Yeah. And so Randy comes in in the Ventador and he's, he's like, Johnny, there's no brakes. The, <laughs> the brakes are totally gone. If you push three times, you might get a brake. So and poor Jesse's like, you know, strapped into the passenger seat. I'm like, cool, 700 horsepower car, Laguna Seca, here we go, you know. And uh, yeah, there was no brakes. <laughs> yeah. We made it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I just really enjoyed driving the Porsche. I just think the way that car goes down the road, on the open road, it, 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 I've said it before, it flows like quicksilver. The car is just, all the trans transitions are beautifully linear, whether you're steering or braking or accelerating, so that you're always feeling that you can really take, approach the, the limits of the car and the limits of your ability. You know, you can figure out 
what's going to happen. It's not going to surprise you. Yeah, and that 9-11 and the BRZ too, you can put it right at the edge of the friction circle and just sort of draw that circle around a road. That's what I really loved about those two cars. The thing about the BRZ is that if you can drive quickly over a given piece of road in that car, you'll be quick in any car. It teaches lots of valuable lessons about how to you know, drive a great driver's car. If you want the best driving car you can get for not a lot of money, it's the BRZ. Oh, Mortara said, you know, he said, if you factor in money, BRZ is the hands down winner. Everybody loved the donuts that we did at the end of the drag race, and they wanted to know where did that idea come from? It's kind of a collaborative <laughs> effort. Oh, let's no, 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 no. Hang on, let's talk about what you wanted to do. I wanted to power slide the thing more. I wanted to drift it. I basically let's wanted to spend a day about, drifting it. Let's, yeah. Drag race is a bit of fun because, you know, a lot of guys, we've all done it. We've all sat around in bars with beers and said, ah, you know, this thing hammers this one because it's two tenths faster. Well, what does that look like? What does that mean? What does it sound like? All right, another question was the AMG's got a 6.2 liter, the badge says 6.3. What's up with the discrepancy? Yeah, Carlos. Automakers lie. <laughs> they like to round up conveniently. I'm a little OCD, but it really annoys me that the engine is 6.2 liters and the badge is 6.3. I just sit there going, why? <laughs> just I've just stopped caring. One I mean, or the scary. other. What do we think about the McLaren? People, I guess, expected yes. it to perform better. They wanted to know what might have held it back. Overall, the car had a non-organic feel to me. And, you know, to, to be a great driver's car, it needs to have this sort of, uh, this sort of, uh, consistency in all the, all the attributes of it. And the McLaren has this inconsistency, not in a bad way, it's just in a, in a way that's sort of surprising and, and a bit challenging for me. But I think it's, it's just a hard car to connect with emotionally, whereas you, know, you get out of the Porsche and you turn around and you look at it and you go, hey, how can I buy this? Yeah. McLaren's like, that was cool, neat, <laughs> moving on. Well, I ranked it in the context of a driver's car competition, thinking that, how does this make me feel as a driver? Well, it makes me feel not very good because I know the car's doing a lot of the work and it's very good at doing that work. It's very effective at going on a racetrack, but as a driver, it left me kind of like, that's not me doing all this stuff. You know, if we were to represent uh, electronic intervention, it'd be like 911 GTR McLaren. You know, it's just a whole nother world of intervention. Yeah, yeah and Randy, I mean, Randy said that as much. He said, this is a whole new type of sports car. Yeah, it feels like car, sports car 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we're just not used to it, I don't know. So uh, this touches on what a lot of people were asking us, which is what do we think about all the technology in the cars? Is there too much technological assistance? To me, the whole point of having electronic nannies is that yeah, we all drive quickly on the road, but you're never going at nine, 10 tenths. The nannies give you that little bit of margin for error. The point about a, a great, a great uh, you know, set of electronic aids in a car is, is one that does not change the baseline calibration of the chassis. Okay, so the tires are a big factor though. We should talk about the tires on the cars. Our view is if, if the, the tires are available as an option across the counter through the dealer, if you can get you know, uh, cup tires on your car, then they should have cup tires. You know, the smart manufacturers will send the cars to best driver's competition with uh, cup tires on the best possible combination you can get. So does anybody know how many sets of tires we actually went through? We went through one set, one set on the Mustang, one set on the Camaro, two sets on the C63. I'll take personal responsibility for that because that thing was a lot of fun and I think that was it. Brakes we went through a surprising amount of. <laughs> BRZ, rotors were not in good shape at the end. Uh, the Mustang and Lamborghini, they came back. Yeah, well, I, th I, th I think in both those cases, it was just the heat problem. Like the Lamborghini, the brake fluid boiled. Well, we could see uh, when Randy was on it in the Lamborghini, we were watching it as he comes into turn 11, which is the last one to complete the lap. Don't often see this on race cars, let alone a road car, but you could see the, the disc glowing red, yeah. dull red, which means they're getting an awful lot of heat into them. And I just think the fluid wasn't there. People say, why don't we change the tires? Why don't we change the fluid? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? Well, it's kind of, you start, kind of start going down a slippery slope when you do that. But at the end of the day, you want to keep everything as stock as possible, because that's how the person's going to go to the dealership and buy it. And to me, you know, it can't be a great driver's car if you've always got that little niggle in the back of your head. Well, the brakes aren't quite up to what you expect. And not only that, we got roads like, you know, Highway 33, Big Tahunga Canyon. These are half hour roads if you're going 100 miles an hour more or less, but a lot of braking. 
And I'd like to see you doing 100 <laughs> miles. Give me kilometers an hour. Kilometers right? an hour, of course. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of braking, and so, so yeah. Okay, maybe you're not going to a racetrack, but your favorite road might be 30 miles long, and you're going to overheat those brakes on those two-ton cars. Were, any, were there any surprises this year? I think the Aventador for me, well, I it just. I mean, maybe it wasn't even that surprised. I never thought it through, but like it, it just had no business on a racetrack, and it had a, it struggled up in the canyons. I mean, in a straight line, the thing is a bullet train. It's mm -hmm. just, you know I, was, I hit 147 at one point without really even thinking about it, but it, it's totally unpredictable. Kind of kind of sketchy. Violent. I think it's really violent. Vi yeah, it, ha it has like you know clown car shifts. I mean, just the you know you said just like getting hit in the back of the head with a shovel. I mean, it's just, I have like seatbelt <laughs> marks. <laughs> I think Ron said it best. It's the best car, the best arriver's car. You know, it looks stunning. It sounds fabulous. It goes like stink. They build the best extreme supercar in the world, but the transmission is just simply uncom uncompetitive. It's uncompetitive. It's not what it should be. The chassis is does different things in different modes and you're never quite sure which Lamborghini you're with. And, and the fact that the brakes can go away after two laps of Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca in a car with that performance capability is simply inexcusable. You just can't do that stuff. Right, so I'm already excited for next year's competition. What are we looking at in terms of potential contenders? Ferrari F12, Berlinetta is the big one, but then you got the M5 or M6 hardtop, maybe the M3, maybe the M4. Um, then you got the Jaguar F-Type, you've got the Subaru WRX and maybe STI, maybe an STI version of the BRZ. Um, you've got the, the 911's coming back and maybe with a turbo, maybe with the GT3, maybe with this 50th anniversary model they're not saying a lot about, but next year's 2013, 911 showed up in 1963 and Germans love anniversaries. Uh, SLS Boxster. Black Series, Boxster. I've done, in. just done, you know, 5,000 miles through Italy in a Boxster, including driving around the Targa Florio course, and it's quite a driver's car. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, by the way, that's another car we asked for, and they just, it wasn't available in the U.S. But there's also the refreshed 12C with more power. McLaren. Yes, they've dropped uh, the, what else is there? The first there's part of there's the a lot. <laughs> it might be hard this year, this coming year, I think it's going to be very hard to say you get 10 or 12 uh, down to 10 or 12 contenders. But you know, there's, there's one we forgot that I, I think will make What's it. What's that? The Viper. Oh, yes. That thing? Really? You think? <laughs> well, Maybe? Yeah, the a little bit? <laughs> All right, well, I call the Viper. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Absolutely. Next year.